Okay, can you hear me? Yep, you can hear me? All right, so, um, wow, this looks awesome. It really does. I was talking to the vice chief um, before he came out, and if you think about the opportunity, um, and no offense to the people here, you know, I'm really talking uh, to lieutenants, captains, senior master sergeants, chiefs. Um, you know, I was talking to him before he came out, uh, and being the vice chief of staff of the Air Force is, there are significant pressures, let's just say that. There's a lot of, there's a lot of weight that's on your shoulders, um, no matter what time of year it is, but there's, it's a lot. And it's a lot to leave the Pentagon and travel uh, to be away uh, during any season within the Pentagon, especially this one. You could clearly see, you know, this was like the rejuvenation for him before he walked out. He, he was like, you know, everything I do I don't get excited about. He was excited to do this because, and he described it, you know, the product of LOA is professional development. Um, 19, so 41 years of LOA, that's more than half the time the Air Force has been a separate service. 1991, uh, I went to Chanute Air Force Base uh, to maintenance officer tech school in the way, way back machine. For, if you have graying temples, you might know where Chanute is, but there you go. Uh, my grandfather actually went to maintenance officer school at Chanute 50 years before I did. Um, but anyway, that's, that's not the point. The point being, there was this thing, it was called Maintenance Officer Association then, not Logistics Officer Association, but the, the point being, this captain walked up to Second Lieutenant Miller and said, hey, there's this thing, this organization um, that looks at the vexing problems, that, you know, the really tough problems, and banters ideas back and forth, and uh, you know, you had you know, you to be nominated and confirm, it was like a whole thing. Um, and so I applied uh, to do that and I thought, so this is an organization that's gonna help me be better at this thing that I'm gonna try to do really well at. Why wouldn't I join that organization? And symposiums are incredible. I mean, the professional development opportunity you've got from being here is unmatched. There's a whole lot of professional development that happens in your wing, you know, in a, squadron uh, staff meeting room and TTPs that are discussed on a Friday with chips and salsa and something else maybe. And you're sitting there and just bantering back and forth on the really tough problems that you're trying to work your way through. And there's, there's a lot to be said uh, for that certainly. So we're gonna move to the next slide so you're not looking at me anymore. So, you know, putting an event like this together uh, the audience that's here, um, whether you work in, you know, on a flight line, in a MUNS, in a port, uh, anywhere in an LRS, in a complex, uh, on a staff, this forum, Loa University, all the educational benefit uh, from yesterday, uh, which, you know, I'm envious uh, of getting, that education is key. Um, this is all for you. Uh, when I was Captain Miller, an AFPC assignments officer, I came to the first LOA and it was back to back. I, we print like these binders of surfs. Uh, there's some people in here that did it with me and you would sit there and go 15 minute shots of sitting there walking, and this is lieutenants through lieutenant colonels that you're walking, yeah, I think the right next move for you is this, have you thought about that? Um, it's just amazing to see what can be accomplished in a couple of days. That was a world before developmental teams. You know, the DTs that we have now, uh, is, that's a huge investment by a lot of the colonels in this room that are, or are online uh, that spend their time um, with the CFMs that General Hurry champions uh, across the board to really look at what is the right next move for that officer? What is the right developmental how do you try to play, you know, chess, not checkers, in thinking your way through assignments and professional development opportunities? Um, the world of DTs is immeasurably better uh, than uh, what I was doing when I was a captain because, frankly, it's like walking, when you're, 
you're a captain assignment officer, you haven't been a lieutenant colonel, obviously. So you don't know what the, it's like going through a room with the lights either off or dimmed quite a bit. And now with the investment by Air Force leadership, um, you're getting, we're making better decisions uh, as an enterprise. So the, you know, this, this volunteer organization called LOA uh, and the DT development of professional logisticians, they're all part of one kind of ecosystem to make you better at what you do. Uh, if you didn't want to be better at what you're doing, uh, you wouldn't take the time to come here and you wouldn't spend the time you know, to kind of hone your, your tasks. So I really want to thank you know, the, the planners for this event. This takes a lot. It takes a lot to run LOA, and it takes a lot to put on a symposium, and they're extremely professional. And it seemed, just because it looks so smooth, um, there are you know, Olympic cheetah flips that are going on to make it happen to look this good, I guarantee you, but we never see it. So thanks to the entire you know, executive board and all the volunteers uh, that are here. The vice chief talked about mission generation under attack as the theme. Uh, and certainly, you know, half A4 doesn't, uh, doesn't try to influence what the theme is, but I could not be more appreciative that that's what it is. Uh, it, is the thing, it is the vexing problem uh, that need to, we need to get after. So 2022 was a year for the record books. Uh, logistics is, was the central activity, and I can't think of a time in our history when that was more the case. Last year, you drove rapid nuclear modernization by fielding new weapon systems and setting a course for the first ever fifth gen nuclear integration to become a reality. That is no small task. You demonstrated responsiveness in mobilizing units from across the globe at scale in hours to produce combat air, air patrols on the eastern flank of NATO. An incredible effort that reassured uh, not only our allies, but demonstrated American resolve showcasing to Russia, our logistics dominance. You supported from across an ocean while they were mired and stalled attempting to just uh, execute logistics miles from their border. Make no mistake, the Joint Force sees this logistics enabling effort. I just went on a trip with the other, they call it the service force, so A4, G4, you can see how that plays out. So we all went with the J4 uh, and OSD uh, to Indo-PACOM trip, and it was readily apparent. There was, um, there was excellence and hard work that's going on uh, to get after the pacing challenge uh, right in front of us. From all the corners of the force, you tested, expertly packed, shipped over 2,400 munitions items, prompt deliveries that really are providing for the fight against tyranny. As a community, you continue to pioneer Agile Combat Employment. Uh, you tested what works, what doesn't work, pack out options, and looked, and, you know, and when, you, when you experiment, sometimes things will not work. The time to figure that out is now. And you figured out a lot of things that do work, and, and we're taking that as, as our way forward. So that innovative spirit covered a lot of ground, um, but we know there's much more to do. ACE is now part of the conversation with the joint force. It's the recognized scheme of maneuver. Uh, it's no longer a theory. Uh, and importantly, it also brings us much closer to our allies and partners. So when we, th when we think about the absolute um, proliferated goodness of what logistics can do, allies and partners speak the same language uh, of logistics that you do. The same problem sets, work on many of the same weapon systems. Uh, and really, when you look at interoperability, one of the most visible ways of doing that is through what you do every day in logistics. The integration uh, you know, can be recognized uh, across our nation. I think when you, if you said to someone, uh, supply chain constraint five years ago. Uh, you guys all know what it meant. If you talk to somebody in your family, they'd be like, yeah, I've heard of that. Post-COVID, 
post, you know, uh, cavitation of the pump, of moving uh, things out of ports, rail lines. Now it's part of everyone's everyday conversation. Logistics professionals are absolutely recognized as warfighters, and logistics as a deterrent, which is an incredible statement, has become part of the lexicon, uh, I can tell you, inside the Pentagon. Without a doubt, agile combat, and, uh, agile combat support is how mission generation occurs. Last year, Tesseract scaled airmen powered ideas uh, across the logistics enterprise, to, and especially with theory of constraints. The vice chief hosts uh, Spark Tank and a, a lot of the innovation efforts to get something out of, from ideas to scale. And he talked about that in, in the slide. Uh, the fact that the vice chief can roll Tesseract off the tip of his tongue like that tells you the level of connectedness uh, that you're having. Both Tesseract and AFIT uh, have made huge fundamental efforts in getting theory of constraints as part of the arrows that you have in your quiver of how to do logistics. It, it yes, born in the industrial complexes, uh, and it's born in big MRO activity, it is on flight lines, it is in ports, it is in uh, squadrons across the Air Force, uh, and Tesseract has a lot to do with that. Evolve is a secure website where you can learn more about that. It's CAC enabled and things can be posted there to help uh, provide that education across in a secure environment to anyone in this room. Uh, here's just a couple of examples for theory of constraints, none of which are from an air logistics complex where that's where a lot of the information comes from, but I just want to share a couple with you. Holloman Air Force Base faced a challenge in producing F-16 B Corps students. Through their analysis, they discovered that they needed 15 aircraft per day uh, per AMU uh, available to produce train, the training that's required. At the time, they struggled to have 12.6 available a day. After engaging with the Tesseract team and employing theory of constraints, they found unique ways to implement bundled maintenance and TOC principles to identify an, an accomplished aircraft downtime. So, What's interesting is, you know, through the journey of lean, theory of constraints, sometimes I'll, I'll do a base visit and I'll, I'll talk to someone who's maybe a little more senior. Uh, you know, as I get older, my definition of senior has changed. I can guarantee you that. Um, you know, when I, was, when I was a lieutenant, my first chief uh, had been in the Air Force for 29 years. And I thought, oh my gosh, 29 years. How, does, how can he even get in from his car, you know, to the, <laughs> this is unbelievable. So to, we go on our first TDY and uh, we go to the rental card counter. I'm not old enough to rent the car. You have to be 24 to rent a car in the early 90s. And so he, and he made sure everybody in the airport knew, Lieutenant Miller. <laughs> so he rented the car, he wouldn't let me drive, it was a thing. But, but when I think about you know, the, the, the things that he had experienced in Vietnam, and, and we've got some Vietnam veterans in this room right now, um, when we think about the journey our nation has been on, that seems, that doesn't seem that long ago to me, but I can tell you when I was a lieutenant, and many of the people maybe sitting a little closer here were lieutenants, Vietnam was only 15 years before every senior NCO in my unit had a Vietnam service ribbon. So you go to you know, ALS graduation and every one of them had a Vietnam service ribbon. That was only 15 years ago. 9-11 is longer ago to you than Vietnam was when, when I came in the Air Force. The, the development and the journey that the Air Force has been on in the last 10, 20, 30 years is absolutely remarkable. There's 250,000 less active duty airmen in the Air Force than when I went to Chinook. Quarter of a million less active duty airmen. Yet the pace that you operate at is just blistering. Um, and how do we do that? 
Well, we've made some trades, and we've had to, and we might have to make some trades again. Back to Holloman's success. So when Holloman looked at that, rebundled, uh, and, and the point being that maybe someone would say, well, how many times have we re-looked re at phase and scheduled maintenance? A lot of times. But it's different people doing it now. So if, if you did it when, if you re-looked at bundling maintenance when you were a captain or a senior master sergeant or a chief and you've moved on, that unit's still doing phase, probably on the same airplane. Um, sometimes those lessons have to be relearned. And Holloman did. They had an in incredible benefit to where not only did they cut the number of aircraft uh, that were in scheduled maintenance in half, uh, and phase work days from 11 days to six days, a huge benefit was reduction of weekend duty. They had gone 29 weeks of consecutive weekend duty, and now it's once about every other month. For Luke, another example, uh, and this is uh, interaction with Tesseract, is Project Slingshot. In getting theory of constraints, Again, to change the scheduled maintenance bundling uh, process, to provide white space on the calendar, to do preventative maintenance so that you aren't reactionary. You're doing the preventative maintenance um, to increase, not, not just increase your MC rate, but decrease your abort rate, decrease your repeat recur rate, and have a more reliable aircraft because you built the goodness in um, with the time versus reaction. So an example, uh, from LRS, which I love this. So Lieutenant Cur Colonel Sarah Bowles calls it LRS at Lake and Heath, which is awesome. <laughs> and she was talking about the IDRC process. And I used to be the IDO at Lake and Heath. And knowing how incredibly turbulent that can be when, you, when you're in Europe and you get an additional um, requirement that pops into the wing, they looked at their process uh, and they've decided it was too inflexible when they were planning uh, for TDYs and deployments and that it was 150 days. When they went through and broke it down, they learned that the information early doesn't mean the information's accurate and early. And so they were going through, uh, did a theory of constraints event and, and changed the process and have massively reduced the timeline it takes becoming more flexible to be able to operate much faster. They've cut 35 days out of their process uh, through their, the application of theory of constraints. So I just want to share those couple of examples with you because it's not only a, um, it's, it's not just an industrial environment opportunity to implement TOC. Uh, you can do it anywhere. I have not found an environment that you can't do it in. So Tesseract is doing uh, more than just theory of constraints. Uh, and when we think about the professional development that's here, uh, you really have to think, and I'm not going to steal any of uh, um, General Drew's thunder for tomorrow, but you've got to really think about the, we had Lowy University yesterday, the logistics university that is Shepard Air Force Base, and the changes that have been going there, where they've really moved from a you know, a tech school to a tech-flavored leadership school, which is what we really need. The innovation there is going to pay uh, incredible dividends for us. And it's, if you have the opportunity to be an instructor uh, at Shepard, you should seize it. Uh, I can tell you there are, there are things in our Air Force that have much broader impact than just being in that, that one squadron or wing. Shepard is absolutely one of them. So please think about it. So as we, so the accomplishments uh, are incredible uh, to review. I think the linkages, uh, that's and which is a great picture, you know, of our future is is its combined operations and joint operations are not being in your own service, producing the final thing, and then just coexisting. They are working together, just like that picture describes. The world is a different place. Uh, it is a 
dangerous place. I got a little behind. So, uh, at the, so when I went to Chanute in 91, so I'd spent the 80s preparing for the Soviet Union. That's, that's, that was it. And to be frank with you, I didn't know what would the Air Force do without the Cold War. I actually wondered, will there be a place for me in the Air Force? Will it be you know, meaningful work? Will it matter? Um, and the journey that you guys have all seen, um, it does matter. You can't predict it. But in 1991, it was the end of the Cold War. The Gulf War just telegraphed to the entire world the capability of air power. Um, but to be frank, over the next 25 or so years, um, it wasn't really the great power competition uh, on the left. It was counter-violent extremism. And, um, and I won't say it was there was, a, there was not a contested uh, environment for logistics. Largely, that's true. Um, not 100% true. So uh, that picture in the upper right, uh, there are some really brave logisticians. Um, one of them, Chief Schultz's uh, now retired chief um, wife that was a, that was a um, convoy commander. You know, we had tech sergeants, logisticians that were convoy commanders driving thin skin trucks of fuel from Kuwait to Baghdad. I think if we talk to them, they might share with us that there, are, there has been some contested logistics. But on the whole, if we, there were absolute exceptions. But on the whole, the lessons that our Department of Defense and that our Air Force and that, you know, really our nation has observed is on the whole, it, is, it hasn't been contested logistics for the vast majority of what we've done. And so we made trades. Uh, we made trades in much more efficiency versus effectiveness. Um, it, it's like taking a rubber band and pulling it a little tighter. There's not a lot more. You can get more out of it, but there's not a lot more uh, to pull on it. That's not the world we live in. <clears throat> it's changed. Um, it's changed. The NDS captures that. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can see that the entire energy is slewing towards great competition. <clears throat> Excuse me. You shouldn't breathe in coffee. You should only drink it. But <laughs> so we've made those. We've we've gone for two arguably almost three decades of, of thinking uh, of the, not as much about great power competition, um, but of a largely rotational, very predictable, often to the same place uh, model. And, and, and that's changing. Um, Hunter mentioned that, you know, I had the honor of being the maintenance group commander at Bagram, and there's others in this room, you know, one that, uh, several that have that were there as well. I had one. There was a chief that came from a C-130 unit, and it was his eighth. No kidding, eighth time to Bagram. What he reflected on, though, was even though he had been to Bagram eight times, it had changed. You know, from the right after 9/11 to the late 2000s. As much change as he saw, Bagram or Al Udeed, radically different than great power competition. <clears throat> this team is going to be the one that's prepared for that. So in general, people love new airplanes. I do. KC-46, F-35, we, do ha we are spending um, a lot of hard-earned taxpayer dollars to buy new weapon systems um, for the fight that we want to win in competition, but if it isn't in competition, we win in an actual fight. So there are some notable examples. We just had the rollout of the B-21. KC-46 is being fielding. We have over 377 F-35s in the Air Force now. That's a lot. 
But if you look at the balance of the rest of the fleet, it is the oldest, it is still the oldest fleet the Air Force has ever had. Um, the new car smell <laughs> that was in an airplane um, when I was a lieutenant is no longer there. And the second Lieutenant Miller F-15Es, uh, they're flying. I've seen the tail number, they're at Seymour and Mountain Home right now. I've seen several of the tail numbers and although I don't know, Kim is here in this room somewhere and she'd probably counsel me heavily. She wonders why I can remember tail numbers from when I was a lieutenant um, and I can't remember our you know, post office box number. Where, oh, she's over there. Um, I love airplanes, honey. I can't help it. So if you think about the challenges of fielding new weapon systems and maintaining old weapon systems, they're different, but they're both hard. Uh, and old airplanes find unique ways of breaking. And when you're a kid, if you ever made an airplane model and you use that you know, toxic glue that makes your eyes water and you glue it all together, what if somebody came back and said, hey, you know part number four that's the center of the airplane? That needs to be changed. That's what your depots have to do with literally saws cutting into part number four to cut a piece out of it and put it back in. Can we do that? Yes, we can. There is no doubt. The capability of the United States of America, the capability of our logisticians, no doubt we can. There's a cost to that. There's a dollar cost, there's a time cost, there's a cost. So I want you to know, we know how hard you're working to keep airplanes flying. So, Another aspect of that change from the, the world that we've been living in to the world we're in is we've been consuming readiness at a faster rate than we can generate it. That's a problem. So that's why Afforgen is created, is to get us in a cycle that's more predictable where we can reset, train together, be prepared, and deploy and that cycle is important so that we don't outpace the readiness that we're generating. I could not, you know, if I had submitted, hey, have the vice chief put a blade slide up, I'm not sure I could have gotten it in there. I was excited to see um, him pitch that. And I know we're going to talk about it uh, more today. So I want to, you know, a couple of quotes I'm going to give you from, uh, from General Brown uh, today. And, and one of them that I think is really vital for us to think about, and it's, and it's, on, it's on ACE and it's on MCA. Uh, a couple of weeks ago he said, as we embrace ACE, we all must be multi-capable airmen. It's not a checklist of qualifications, it's a mindset and a technical competency um, that when things hit the fan, our airmen are ready. I'm more than certain that if mentored and led, um, Airmen will figure out how to do it. It won't be the generals. It, it won't be the SESs. It won't be the chiefs. It will be the tech sergeants, master sergeants, captains, and lieutenants that accomplish that. Uh, that's why I'm so excited to see you here. Being a credible expert is critical. For you to be curious and learn, Loa University, learning from the speakers that talk here today, um, You've got to be able to, ex to excel in the technical stuff and the human domain. Both of them matter. Having the credibility, uh, because you're technically competent, to go in and use the people skills that you really need to, to provide an environment of trust, to provide an environment um, where Somebody doesn't feel like they're looking, you're, you're looking over their shoulder, but you're there to help them. That's, that's art. That is the art of leadership um, that the 19-year-olds that you're charged with taking care of deserve. Um, and the way to, and it takes work to get good in both. We need you to get good in both. And I see it every time I go to a wing. You are good at both. Somebody told me that credibility is the currency exchange
for dis decision support and resources. And that is so true. If you have credibility, you will likely get the resources. Um, it may be that you're going into your wing and saying, hey, we're, we don't have the resources we need to effectively take care of the support equipment. We don't have the resources we need um, to stop the leak in the roof that's dripping on the engine shop. If you're credible and they go, you know, uh, Captain Smith or Senior Master Sergeant Jones is the credible leader that only brings forward the, the real stuff, you probably get the resources. Um, that's blue chips that you have to build up over time. I love CV-22s, but that's not the most important thing in this picture. The airman standing underneath that CV-22 is the most important thing. Being technically competent and being human being competent uh, is vital to everybody in this room. <clears throat> so, so when you signed up for the Air Force, you signed up for a different gig. You signed up for the service uh, that you ask a lot of questions. And sometimes those questions are hard to answer. Um, why, the question why is really important to an airman. If I was gonna characterize the, hey, what's the culture um, and what, what makes an airman different? That's at least one of the big things, is understanding why. Um, Americans have it imprinted in our DNA and uh, Baron Frederick Wilhelm von Steuben, uh, you know, was the Prussian leader that was at Valley Forge to kind of reset the Continental Army. And this is what he wrote in his diary, which is incredible. In Europe, you say to a soldier, do this, and he does it. But I'm obliged to say to the American, this is why you ought to do this. And only then does the soldier do it. So think about that. That is so true. If you explain why to your young airmen, you're not going to be there all the time. And if they know the why, that's, that's mission command. That's them being able to execute when you're not there. That also tells them you trust them. It requires you to know why to be able to have that conversation with them. So let's talk about resiliency for just a moment. I think solutions for resiliency, um, programs are important, but that's not where the solutions really come from. I want to highlight two of them. I think Chris Clark is here. I think I saw him here. Um, the Airmen for Life program, which can be applied in different ways, uh, and has been in different wings. If you're interested in learning more about that program, uh, certainly talk to him while you're here. Fortify the Force is another program I want to highlight. <clears throat> Picture of Chief Bass uh, there, but Chief Bass and Chief Toberman um, are huge advocates of this program, and, and so, okay, Miller, what is it? It's a volunteer, grassroots effort of some retired, uh, some enlisted some officers, some civilian members that really want to look at the issues of resiliency uh, within the force. They, there is some criticism of the career fields that are sitting in this room that we eat our own. Um, I'd say in some cases that's true. I'd say in more cases it's probably ill-informed. Um, but in either case, it's probably talking about the past. And the past is important to know about, but it's not the world that your airmen are going to live in. They're going to live in the world that you provide them. So if you provide an environment where if somebody is struggling with something, they get the attention they need. If they feel like they can come to their, next, their first line supervisor with an issue and talk to them about it and be heard, that's what matters to them right now, is the world they're living in and going to live in. So there may have been things in the past, and we shouldn't ignore them, but I'd ask you to connect with Fortify the Force or Airmen for Life or many other initiatives that are getting after resiliency. 
Um, it's not just a, it's not a personnel program, it's a human being program. Um, please look at it. So I wanna, I know I'm running long on time and there's no like red flashing light here or anything yet, um, but, <clears throat> but you need to do, get a coffee refill uh, eventually. I just, for a few seconds, I just wanna say that putting the Logistics Officer Association Symposium Wonderful opportunity. Uh, and I'm, I encourage you to connect with each other and keep those connections uh, after you leave this symposium. But for the other 11 months and three weeks of the year, you don't have to wait to have another professional development opportunity that long. I'm not kidding about the chips and salsa, you know, in a, in a break room and having a TTP discussion on a Friday. That's where a lot of that really can make a difference. You could have a squadron commander in there, a command chief, a discussion on stuff that's happening in your wing right now. And you can do that. I've been, I've, I've seen a LOA chapter at Balad, at Bagram, at, at every base uh, that I've had the honor to be at. They're, they don't always look exactly the same. I mean, it's not always exactly LOA members that are in the discussion, but I've always walked away knowing more than I started with. It's a great way, it really is a great way to connect. And coming here, you're going to get to hear, you know, you got to hear from the vice chief, you're going to get to hear from General Minahan, you're going to get to hear from General Hawkins and General Morris, and, so, and just like you keep going, the leadership talent that's going to talk to you those are the people that are, that are moving our Air Force forward. The re event for them is to come and interact with you. So it's a two-way exchange of energy. I'm excited for this week. Uh, I'm excited for everything you guys are doing. Uh, I do want to say, and seeing Tiffany Kalen over there, I just want to say being the lower president is kind of a lot. Um, <clears throat> it is kind of a lot. And Jay Kalen is a dedicated uh, colonel in the United States Air Force, works tirelessly with a huge team to put all this content together. That happens at night. It happens on the weekends. It happens when you're doing phone calls in between airplane flights. Uh, so Tiffany, I want to thank you for donating Jay's time uh, to, to 2,000 people. <clears throat> Last thing, I promise. Um, General Brown said a couple of weeks ago, um, air power is the answer because of airmen. And air power is the answer. And if, if he was standing here looking at this crowd, uh, that is the rebluing event. The air power is the answer because of airmen. And the airmen in this room are the ones that are going to make it happen. I'm proud of you. I'm excited to be on your team and looking forward to the symposium. Thanks. Thank you.